Hi, my name is Andrew Sears, and um, I'm going to be presenting at the Sailor Academy Summit later this week. And I like to record my talks on YouTube in advance so that if people want to access them later, um, they can. So um, let me just give you a little bit of my background and what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so many of you are familiar with the technology adoption life cycle, and, and I don't know if you've heard of the concept crossing the chasm, but it was uh, popularized by Jeffrey Moore. And um, basically the idea is you start with a product, and I don't know how many of you were some of the innovators that got the early Palm Pilots. Um, I even had one that had a dial-up modem with it, so I was definitely in the innovator crowd um, with that. and. Um, this would be the crossing the chasm issue for smartphones. So, you know, um, you started with the Palm Pilots and then later you went to the Palm Trios or some people went with, you know, Windows and, um, and ultimately the group that crossed the chasm was the iPhone. Um, and that's really an example of what happens is the types of technologies that initially target um, the lead users and the early adopters kind of targeted for geeks really aren't the same types of technologies that uh, reach the early majority and the late majority. So um, a little bit more of my background. Um, I actually got started at MIT's Internet Telephony Consortium and I was kind of an expert in voice over IP. Um, Co-founded this with one of the fathers of the internet, um, David Clark. and we had the who's who of the companies serving the innovators and early adopters in uh, voice over IP and, and IP telephony. And uh, I actually had a, a startup, was a part of MIT's business plan competition and had the uh, C CEO who took CUC Me public join our startup um, that never ultimately launched. And uh, the other claim to fame that I, that I had was uh, I um, almost joined WebEx, and, but I thought my business plan was better than theirs, but they were going after the early majority and I was going after the innovators. So what's interesting about the case history for me around voice and video I over IP is every single company that was a part of MIT's Internet Telephony Consortium, um, almost every single one of them didn't cross the chasm. Ultimately, none of them became um, Vonage, Skype, or WebEx and um, serving the early majority. And, you know, a lot of those now are being superseded by groups that are targeting more of the late majority. So Apple's FaceTime, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, WeChat. And I think there's some lessons to, to learn in this, and I'm gonna talk about those a little bit later, but I wanna talk about another case study. So I was at MIT and I had, um, you know, gone through that my first job after MIT as uh, working uh, making $200 an hour, working half time, making 200,000 a year. And I realized that my heart was really more for community change. So I stopped doing that and started up a computer center. Um, I uh, used a f and was a part of the digital divide movement, this community technology centers network. We were a partner with a grant um, with them and I had a faith-based network that was kind of the faith-based counterpart to there. Um, and we were targeting really the innovators and early adopters to address the digital divide. Um, but what happened is CTCNet and many of the computer centers that we started and even the association that I helped um, start, we failed to cross the chasm. And ultimately the groups that crossed the chasm were the groups that served the mainstream people. It was the boys and girls clubs, it was the, the public libraries, it was the uh, nonprofit technology network. And what they did is they, they decided to target the average users and a lot of these innovators went um, to the wayside and now um, those addressing the digital divide I would say Google's actually at the forefront of that so um, so again I'm you know now focused on uh, disrupting higher education and last year we were a partner with Sailor Academy and launching a five thousand dollar total cost degree path so um, and using Sailor's materials um, for the first couple years of that and um, then combining that um, with accredited U.S. degree and you could get a $5,000 bachelor's or $2,000 associates. We got featured in Forbes and um, we've learned some things. You know, this was launched not that long ago, but we've learned that, you know, at the end of the day, ultimately there's a lot that you need to do to cross the chasm. So that's a lot of what I'm going to talk about in this. But, um, you know, the title of my talk is how do you 
across the chasm to serve a billion um, students with, you know, open education. How does open education cross the chasm? And, and ultimately, that's the vision that I want to outline. So let's just start with the idea, how do we get to a billion students? And you, you start with some of the basic information of what's going to happen over the next, um, you know, 15 years or so. 84% of higher education growth is going to be in developing countries. There's this growing emerging middle class, um, 4.9 billion middle class by 2030. And we're moving from 100 million students in higher education in 2000 to 263 million by 2025. So the question is, how does this alternate system going to be helping meet that need? So ultimately, you got this base global digital ecosystem. And what you're going to have is you're going to have a free courseware layer on top of that. So that's going to be free MOOCs, free open education, um, and free apps. And then on top of that, you're going to have a new system that's already being formed that many of you are a part of, you know, the alternative credit. So hundreds of millions of people are going to be getting alternative credit. Um, and ultimately, I think that's going to concentrate around college years one through three. Um, the average global cost, I think, is going to ultimately end up being close to $100 a year. Um, it's going to be building on courseware. It's going to have different delivery methods, micro campus, online mobile delivery. And um, I believe that by 2030, more than 50% of the global market share of tertiary education will be alternative education. Um, and then on top of that, so some people will just do that and they'll go straight for a job. Um, but on top of that, you're going to have bachelor's degrees. So that last year, I think, is going to, on average, cost about $1,000 a year globally. You're going to have the full range of, of university degrees, and you're going to have online and micro campus um, delivery, mobile um, also. And ultimately, um, you're also going to be having campuses. I don't think campuses are going to disappear. Um, but I think that they're going to radically change. So, you know, there's things that you need to do in person. You know, if you're training someone to be a welder or if you're training them, um, you know, to do something, you know, physically, a chef or, you know, whatever it is that you're going to do, um, you need to have some, some physical um, facilities. Um, and, but I think that there's going to be new forms of doing that. And I think that the global average cost is going to be around $2,000 a year. Um, and I think the primary growth is going to be something that I'm going to call micro campuses. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean um, for that. And uh, I think that it's going to be critical for the early majority and maybe the late majority to have some of these physical campuses. So, um, so if that's the, the vision that we're going after, how do we get from where open education is? And, you know, I'm sold out for open education. Like I said, I, I quit my job making 200 bucks an hour to make, you know, about an eighth of that now. And I've, I've worked among the poor and lived among the poor in a house that, you know, has bullet holes in it and um, have been, you know, working to make a difference, have, have seen, you know, many, many lives change, but I want to see it at scale. So, Ultimately, you know, we're starting off serving this innovator market of homeschool, the uncollege market, the autodidactics, you know, people who can just learn on their own, learn anything on their own, um, people who just want to do non-credit personal enrichment and cost-conscious innovators. And, you know, sailors at the front of that, MIT Open Courseware, I'm, you know, friends with one of the guys who helped start that, um, iTunes U is there, Moodle's there, and then there's a group of of organizations that are trying to cross the chasm that I would say are kind of pioneering that space. So some of the MOOCs, edX, Coursera, Straighter Line, I think is trying to cross the chasm. Canvas is probably, you know, the best example right now among um, learning management systems of, you know, they're, they're paying a lot of attention to the types of things that the early majority um, is important to the early majority. And then there's groups that I would say have fairly successfully crossed the chasm. So. Um, Lynda.com being, you know, acquired by Microsoft. Udacity, um, I would argue, has crossed the chasm. Um, Open University, Arizona State, Southern New Hampshire, Western Governors. Um, and really who they're targeting is they're targeting corporate education. They're targeting disruptive mega universities. Um, they're targeting OER and community colleges. They're going after the early high school market. I was told by Western Governors that's their biggest growth um, domain. And they're also looking at how do we get access to government aid. And then you have the late majority. And, and the late majority 
um, you know, you're going to be, I think, looking at developing countries is going to be a huge aspect of that. And then you're going to be seeing what I would describe education as a feature of tech platforms. You're going to see groups like Google and Microsoft a lot more. Um, you know, m music now is a feature whenever you buy your iPhone and you decide are you going to subscribe or not. And I think that that's what the future of a significant part of education is going to be with Microsoft and, and others. And I think there's going to be something... If you look at what Amazon, you know, why did Amazon just buy Whole Foods? Well, I think Whole Foods is going to be radically different um, in the future because I think Amazon is going to run it as a digital first um, retail outlet. And um, they're going to, uh, you know, like they've done with the Washington Post, think a lot about how are we using digital delivery um, and leveraging digital. Um, and I think that the same thing is going to happen with these what I call mass market micro campuses where you might see uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of these these small outlets where um, people can do the face to face um, stuff that they couldn't do somewhere else. And it's the same reason why why does um, Apple have retail stores? Because ultimately you have to have a physical location to serve the late majority. Um, so if you look at you know, some of the studies that have been done on what are the characteristics between innovators and early majority. So early adopters, or I'm just going to say innovators, um, are tech focused, whereas pragmatists are not. Um, innovators want revolutionary change. I'm an, I'm an innovator. You know, early majority wants evolutionary change. Um, visionary users, um, innovators are visionary. Pragmatists obviously are prag uh, pragmatic. Um, innovators are project oriented where pragmatists are, you know, you got to fill out these forms, you got to do follow our process if you want to, to get this. Um, innovators willing to take risk, pragmatists are more cautious, innovators willing to experiment, pragmatists are looking for you know, proven applications. Um, one of the biggest though I think that we got to really pay attention to is that innovators are individually self-sufficient. You know, whenever I got my computers, I love putting them apart. You know, they're the people who like to take their cars apart um, and put them back together. Um, whereas the early majority, they want to have um, support. And early adopters t uh, and innovators tend to, you know, cross disciplines um, and work with other innovators in other disciplines. Whereas early majority, um, they're going to communicate a lot more vertically or, or focus within a discipline. So that's one of the key th lessons that you, you can learn from uh, Gordon Moore's um, Crossing the Chasm. The other key lesson um, is the idea of a complete product. And the basic idea, and, and Jeffrey Moore talks a lot about this in his book, is you start with a basic product. Like the first PC you would get, you would just get the desktop. You wouldn't, sometimes you, you wouldn't get the, the monitor, you wouldn't get any of the support. Um, and that, that's you know, not very friendly to the average person. That's friendly for geeks. And, and that's kind of the way it works with uh, open education resources and, and, and some courseware. But ultimately, we need to be adding components. So what I'm going to go through is talk about what are the components of a whole product. Now, part of what we have to do is we have to assess which of these, you know, a, a given institution is going to decide to provide and which are they going to partner for, but recognizing that these um, pragmatists are going to be looking for the whole product. So ultimately, one of the things that you need is a highly usable interface. So, you know, Moodle has been brutal for this. I use Moodle. You know, I like Moodle. It's not usable. Um, I'm dying because it's not usable. Um, Open edX has done a lot better. Um, MOOCs have, have done better. Canvas has done better. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, there have to be different products for the, you know, and to put it in business terms, business to consumer market, B2C, versus the business to business market. So the B2C, they just want something super simple. They want to see Duolingo. They want to see, you know, you just tell me the app and I'm going to do it. Um, whereas the B2B wants the flexibility. Um, and ultimately, B2B is going to need a white label platform pr for partners. And ultimately, I think this is going to be an open alternative to some of these OPM um, platforms. These are the, the uh, online program managers um, like 2U and um, some of those. And ultimately, I think there needs to be an open 
solution to those. So the, the next thing that we have to do, and these are things that I've learned, you know, working with Sailor, you know, I'm talking to students day in and day out. I'm talking with partners day in and day out. And they're telling me the usability, man, on, on open, on the stuff that we're doing. This isn't, you know, to, to knock Sailor, this is stuff on our own stuff, on our own um, things where we try to make it more usable. But the other thing we need is, is you got to do much better curation. It has to be contextualized. Um, it needs to be more usable. Um, you can't just say, here's the library of 8,000 open educational resources, pick from that. You need to make it more user friendly um, and limit some of the selection. Um, you need, uh, you know, one of the big gaps that I've seen is there's not courseware that's targeting, you know, all the courseware that's out there, it's the MOOCs. And, you know, they've been criticized for it's, you know, nerds at MIT targeting other nerds that aren't at MIT. Um, and but what about for people who are just average students or remedial students? Um, there's not really that much courseware for them. Um, then there's other, you know, I would say I, I used to play games with these these technology trees and you need components of the technology um, to get to the next level before you can build the next technology. And I think there's some components that we need um, to really get to this next level of a billion students. You're going to need a YouTube of courses. You're going to need um, streamlined access to course exports. We get, you know, sailors course exports, um, but it's not an easy process. And if you're going to get to a billion people, you need to be able to have thousands of people accessing this. Ultimately, what you need, you know, in open source coding, you need, you have something called Git, where it will show the differences and people can build on each other's uh, material. You need a Git and a GitHub um, for courses. And someone needs to build those things. Um, the next component is that is critical is tech support. Um, you need tech support, you need coaching, you need advising, you need faculty support. Um, you, you need people involved. And, um, you know, in B2C, you need to have, you know, free options and four fee options. You can't offer a free option where you have people spending thousands of hours providing support that's quality support. You're going to ultimately have to provide a, a, a a fee for that and um, you need to, to do that ultimately what would be helpful is to have some sort of uh, uber for coaching and for instruction and I know there's organizations that are trying to do that um, one of the other things I'd like to emphasize is there needs to really be a push you know I hear it on MOOCs and I hear it on open education so many about how many students did we get enrolled or registered and everyone knows you need to be focused on completions, not registrations. And we'll critique the MOOCs on that, but it's honestly as true for OER. And I think that that should be Sailor's number one metric should be completions, not um, you know other things. So um, the other thing you need is stackable credit portability. I wrote an article for Clayton Christensen Institute on this. Um, you know we need these alternative quality assurance things. There's been a lot of, you know, progress made for ACE, CLEP, Sailor's done great on that, NCCRS, um, AP. Um, there's a big umbrella initiative that's being proposed right now called CQAL that people should pay attention to. Um, in the UK, there's something called OFQAL that we've, we've looked at. Um, but one of the key things for that is, you know, I would say the biggest gap in terms of just whenever we're building courses using open um, courseware is high quality, affordable, or free assessments. Um, you know, CLEP and AP, if I'm providing that in a developing country for $500 a year, their test costs more than what the students pay um, in, in tuition. So there needs to be better alternatives for that. The, the other thing is, um, you know, groups like Sailor need tighter linkages with traditional institutions. Straighter Line has done a pretty good job of getting articulation agreements. Just because someone, you know, you have ACE credit doesn't mean that these institutions are going to take it. Um, the other thing we need to do better, and this is something community colleges have learned, um, you know, if you show people a menu of 8,000 things to, to get in terms of courses, your success rate is actually really low. But if you give them five tracks they can take, and then you help get them down the tracks, um, then you get much higher success rate. So you need these stackable, integrated, end-to-end -end pathways to degrees. So micro degrees is what most MOOCs are doing. Um, and then the other thing you need also, you know, there's this emerging early college market. You need to start thinking about how do your college courses align with high school standards so that um, people, you know, I, I've talked to many people who, 
their homeschoolers and their students or, or their, their kids graduate high school ha having completed two, three, and sometimes even four years of college. Um, and I think that's a, a critical market to be paying attention to. Um, so if you get the, the stackable credit portability, the next thing you need ultimately is a recognized credential. Now, I'm not saying that has to be a degree. In many cases, that'll be a degree. In other cases, that'll be a cer certification. Um, but ultimately, what you need is you need simple pathway bundles emphasized over individual courses. And um, you need to be able to target learning outcome bundles for jobs in specific vertical industries. So Udacity, the reason why I think they of all the MOOCs have crossed the chasm is because they said we're going to do computer science and um, they've you know partnered with Georgia Tech and they I think have done an uh, outstanding job of, of crossing the chasm whereas a lot of others haven't you know uh, limited themselves um, to, to target one vertical market. Um, you need partnerships with recognized brands and, and universities. Um, you need the ability to white label and integrate with back office systems or strategic partners. This is especially true for things like MOOCs, open education, you know, they can just import the content in. And as, as I said before, I think there needs to be a nonprofit alternative to OPMs that, that both affects the user interface and that affects the recognized credential. We need to have groups that will function as system integrators and as consultants to reassemble these bundles. Um, because that's one of the missing components. So how did PCs ultimately cross the chasm? Well, it was an army of consultants that helped them cross the chasm in many cases. Um, and the last thing, you need to have um, physical outlets for blended learning if desired. So, you know, so for someone like Sailor or MOOCs, you need to have support programs targeting micro colleges, nonprofit partners and study centers. You know, um, how do you how do you guide them in pedagogy? Do you even design thinking about the idea that some people might use your, your content in a blended environment? Um, you know, some I think should be thinking about how do you have franchise mechanisms or, or physical outlets? And um, can you have partnerships and for a practicum, for apprenticeships and you know, things that you know, put into bloom psychomotor um, learning? Um, you know, who wants to get a brain surgeon who studied brain surgery entirely online? It's just not going to work. And there's a ton of fields that, that are like that. So ultimately, the strategy to cross the chasm, if you read Jeffrey Moore's book, and you know, I've lived it for the past 20 years, um, one of the things you have to do is you got to target an initial niche market and then develop a high quality, more complete solution. Um, that's what Udacity has done. You need to assess which components you're going to do in-house and which to do through partnerships. If you try to do them all, then it's going to be a nightmare because you can't do them all and uh, you won't be able to do it well. But then you need to make sure whoever does it does provide a complete product. Um, you know, there's a lot in the OER community that, that you know, only working with nonprofits and pure open, it's an issue of religiousness and dogmatism. And at the end of the day, you know, I've given up tons of money that I could be making to make a difference in people's lives and um, whenever you're trying to get someone a job they don't really care um, about dogmatism they just want to get the job and you know whether it's commercial or, or nonprofit components assembling that together and I, I realize there's trade-offs between those but ultimately in crossing the chasm commercial partners are gonna have to be a part of that um, and intentionally work with select customers in whatever niche you have that require the whole solution to advance lear the learning curve on the whole product. As I work with people who are you know, more pragmatist, um, me being an innovator, they drive me nuts because I think that they need too much. But I realize, no, they're right. Um, the reason why ultimately I didn't join WebEx is because they're going after the pragmatist and you know, that was a, they made $300 million whenever they got bought by Cisco. <laughs> so that was a hard lesson to learn. And I don't want to have to keep learning that lesson again and again. So, um, you know, you have to, to provide a whole solution. So ultimately, I think one of the key debates, and I want to talk about this one, is the pure OER versus freemium business models. And what I'm showing here is a diagram of um, the different layers in architectural diagram and and the pure OER, you have, um, and I'm just going to start off, you know, at the bottom. Um, you have unbundled um, OER learning objects. Then you have an unbundled learning management system. And then, like with Sailor, you have free courses, course 
exports and some basic assessments. And then over on the freemium side, those three things are bundled. So they're bundled with MOOCs, they're bundled with most apps like Duolingo, they're bundled with Arizona State University's Global Freshman Academy, and you can't get their LMS, well, um, you, you can't get their courses generally without going you know, through their LMS, you can't get a course export. Um, often they don't give you access to their learning objects. But one of the key issues is recognizing that as you move up this and you go to courses for credits, credit pathways, and accredited degrees, um, you're, you're trying to cross the chasm. So you're starting off at the innovators and the early adopters. Um, and the problem is that there's this huge communication integration barrier. And this is what I've experienced in working, um, you know, not just with Sailor, but with other, you know, OERs, you know, trying to, to work to bridge the, the chasm with pragmatists. Um, you know, the, the, the huge advantage of OER providers is that you're leveraging near zero marginal cost for content. And if you even charged one penny for those videos, you would lose the primary value for that. Um, and that works really well for, for B2B partnerships, um, where you have others that are trying to reach the pragmatists, you know, building on that, um, whether universities, and whenever I say B2B, I'm also talking about nonprofits or, you know, others. Now, the, the con is, there's this communication barrier here um, and really there's no incentive to cross the chasm um, and you know the, the selling point is you get free near zero marginal cost content that if you you cross the chasm it can be revolutionary so wikipedia um, khan academy you know both of those absolutely revolutionary um, but how do you cross the chasm that's that's the challenge so ultimately what i i think my recommendation is for this space is that oer at the bottom layers, it needs to be donor-based. I mean, there's a reason why Wikipedia and Khan Academy haven't commercialized. Um, but with either tight pragmatist partnerships or with secondary earned income streams. And the reason for that, I would actually say, is more than from the income, but to get better communication. So you get integrated design of lower levels with input from the upper level partner. So I'm talking with people right now that are working on the lower levels and I'm saying whenever you're designing that course, you need to be thinking about the degrees that, that you're designing it for. Um, because ultimately that's the big advantage of the freemium model is they, they have really good communication going on between those two layers across the chasm. So um, they have this financial subsidy where um, essentially what they're doing is they're saying, you know, this free stuff we're giving, it's not sustainable to give it away, but we're gonna subsidize it and um, what that does is, you know, in exchange, you get a student pipeline and um, ultimately, you know, you get better communication across the chasm and it's better for the, the B2C market. Um, the challenge is the funding model really limits the incentive to share content. So you get some groups that say, you know, we're open, um, but they're not very open and they make it really difficult to use their stuff in an open way. Um, but one of the big selling points, I think, you know, if, if you look at the, the data, I'm, I'm pretty sure these freemium groups, you know, and I, I haven't completely crunched all the numbers, but just off the top of my head, I, I would say they're probably 10 to 100 times the volume of completions compared to the OER model. Um, so they're winning. I mean, they're, they're getting the pragmatists, they're crossing the chasm. Um, but ultimately, I think part of what this group needs to do is they need to seek donors that understand the value of opening content to ensure more open sharing. By, um, because if you share it, the reason why they don't want to share it is because they realize they're going to lose revenue if, if they share it openly. Um, so anyway, all that comes to, you know, let me take Sailor Academy as a, a case study. Um, you know, what would be my strategic ideas for someone like uh, Sailor Academy? You know, one would be to really look at the B2B market, the business to business, the business to nonprofits, um, you know, all those together is, is, is one market. And then the B2C market um, is, is different. And I think the main reason for that is you have to learn from the B2C market. So even if you say we're primarily about B2B, if you don't have a channel where you're learning from B2C, then you're not gonna cross the chasm. Um, so, you know, B2B remains in Moodle. Um, you know, it would be great if Sailor could provide a self-serve download to access course exports and also I'd love to upload, um, you know, as we make improvements. Um, 
And, but I would love also if Sailor Academy had a B2C where you provided your content in a more curated way and you would actually use Open edX um, because I think Open edX is a much more usable platform. And you know, I know you guys have material on iTunes U. You know, I uh, think other avenues, Allison, you may be talking with them, or Udemy, I think those are all um, potential places. Um, the other thing is I think you have to have a product line or partnerships that provide support. So. Um, you know, if you recognize that your primary organizational outcome needs to be course completions and not registrations, you know, registrations are what, you know, people in the analytics world call a, a vanity metric. Okay, it, it looks good in terms of marketing, but it doesn't really mean that there's any real change happening. And change happens, you know, you could say it happens through engagement, but I would say the, the big, best measure of engagement is course completions. Um, and you know, seeking coaching, tutoring partners, or you know, schools, accredited schools that you know that's part of what you know City Vision can provide. Um, be more willing to to uh, go down the earned income path and to partner with um, commercial partners. You know, avoiding this OER dogmatism where anything commercial is bad. Um, you know, I think trying to figure out what could be the first niches for Sailor Academy. You know, corporate. I know that Sailor Academy auto already has a partnership with JetBlue. Um, community colleges have a huge need in this space. So that could be you know, one of the first verticals or the first vertical. Um, partnering with Thomas Edison or you know, the, the big three and degree completion. Uh, Western Governor Straighter Line has basically said, we are one of our primary niches we're gonna target is Western Governors and a ton of their students um, you know, come from Western Governors and go to Western Governors. Um, and there's this early college market um, that you could go after. Um, and ultimately, it's those requirements, it's those things that say, you have to do what you're not doing now. And you know, the initial response is, that's not who we are. But if who you are is going to be always to target the 2.5% um, the of, of, of you know, techies who will assemble their whole their own car, their own PC, or their own educational program, um, you're not going to cross the chasm. So, um, and I think the other thing is, is learn from these commercial models. You know, as a nonprofit, I'm always using a fast follower strategy. So, um, look at Straighter Line and how do you replicate what they're doing? OpenStax, Flat World, Lumen Learning. What they're doing is they're saying, man, OER hasn't crossed the chasm, and we're going to build a commercial model to help them cross the chasm. Well, if you don't want the world to all go commercial, the best solution is to get a better nonprofit model that competes more effectively with them um, on what, what people are needing. But the reason why OpenStax, Flat World, and Lumen Learning are making progress is because people are demanding the whole product. Um, you know, Straighter Line, you know, one of the things they did is they, partner they partnered with online tutors. Um, you could replicate Straighter Line's articulation agreements. Um, you know, learn from OpenStax and Lumen on uh, usability. They're doing a better job on curation, better job um, potentially, I think, on, on partnering. So all that is my summary. If you want more on this, I have a ton of material um, on, uh, I have a MOOC that's available on Udemy, iTunes U, YouTube, and SlideShare. You can download that um, if you I uh, just searched for disruptive innovation in higher education. And if you want to follow up with me at some point, just email me. Um, and that's it. Thanks a lot.